through faith in Jesus Christ. I'm so glad to be with you today. Billy's not here today. He is, he is old enough now to have his 50th high school reunion. So please be easy on him when you see him next week. You might want to help him up the steps here if, if you would. But So with reunion and all, he wasn't able to be at church today, but one of his class members made it in. So we'll, we'll, we'll have special prayer for Brother Billy here in a little bit. <laughs> And I will not be able to be with you next Sunday on Mother's Day. I'm preaching up at St. Stephen's Baptist. That's way up the road. So Donna and I will be up there. So today I'm going to give you my Mother's Day uh, message in a little while later this morning. But let's just look through the bulletin a moment and uh, the announcements that you see that are printed there. I think, uh, I don't think there's any additional ones that I've been told. Okay. Oh. I'd like to thank everybody who prayed this check card. I almost died, but God has another plan. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Thank you, man. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We've certainly been praying for you. Yes, ma'am. I'm so glad you. I'm so glad you decided to come on to church. There you go. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other announcements we need to be aware of? All right. Uh, I wanted you to know that, uh, that Kenneth is not with us the, this morning. He had a fall and uh, injured his hip. And uh, so he's not able to sit very long. Isn't that right? I, yeah, so Shirley's going to do everything from right here. All right. So. Th- so we look to Shirley from this way, okay? <laughs> Have any birthdays this past week? Anniversaries or anything? Okay. All right, well, boys and girls, if you're ready for a children's church, you can go with Miss Jennifer. <laughs> now let's continue to prepare our hearts for worship with our call to worship. Holy Spirit, what a blessing it is to be together to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But may we be reminded that you are truly our most honored guest. And we pray now, Holy Spirit, that you will open our minds and hearts to hear your word proclaimed through music, and through proclamation of the word, so that we will go forth and do your word. We pray now in the very loving name of our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's take our hymn books back out and look at hymn 496 that we just sang. No, I'm not going to sing. 
no, 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 no. But what I wanted you to do, if you turn to 496, and if you look all the way down at the bottom of the page, you see the text and the music, but you see the copyright date. What year was that? 1932. Think of what was going on in our nation in 1932. The Depression, people were just living hand to mouth, and yet look at the song that was composed. No one's going to take care of us like Jesus does. Like Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you again thanking you for the life and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and we don't ever want to leave the two separate. Because as important as this life was, the resurrection is important too. For that is where our life comes from. That is how we know that you're going to take care of us. Because of Jesus' love on the cross, the power over the grave, the love that he has to call us all together to be his children. But Father, we're living in some awful, wicked times right now, some difficult times as well. We may not be as financially strapped as they were in the 1930s, but Father, we just think of the mass shooting in Texas yesterday and the eight victims that were taken and we just pray for wisdom and compassion to be shared with these family members. But Father, as we are gathered here at Severin and we feel secure and safe here, we want to also lift up our national Christian leaders, not just government leaders, but our Christian leaders who, who already have a voice that can speak a word of love and compassion. Father, it, it doesn't matter what weapons we take away. We still have the attitude that's there. The hurt and the pain and the suffering. And we know that you will take care of us. May you call on our national Christian leaders, but also upon our, our sovereign leaders and sovereign members that we too can speak a word of compassion to people who are hurting. Father, grant us the time to offer ourselves in dedication to you. These are our desires at this hour. We pray in the very strong name of the King of King and Lord of Lords who taught us to pray this way, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who... And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Just a blessing, you really are, you know. And you, you never make a mistake or anything. <laughs> I just love that. Thank you, thank you so much. And anytime Billy says you want to preach, I say sure. As long as the choir singing, you gotta count me in. <clears throat> well, today I like for us to uh, the pew Bibles that are there in front of you. If you would please take them out, we'll look through Matthew chapter 15, and we'll begin at verse 21 in just a few minutes. Matthew chapter 15. As you're finishing turning there to Matthew chapter 15, verse 21, why do you think God made mothers? Well, I came across an interesting interview with second graders, eight-year-olds thereabouts. Why did God make mothers? And you know what their top answer was? Mostly to feed us. <laughs> and then... Why do you think God gave you your mother and not some other mother? Top answer, because we're related. <laughs> and God knew she liked me more than some other people's mothers would like me. <laughs> but here's, here's my favorite, one of my favorites. <laughs> Who's the boss at your house? Well, Mom is, and I guess because she does a lot more than Dad does. <laughs> And why did your mom marry your dad? Why did your mom marry your dad? Second grader's top answer was, well, my grandma says that she wasn't wearing a thinking cap that day. <laughs> yeah. Second graders have wisdom, don't they? <laughs> there are many pressures that our mothers face each day. And I think today's pressures are tougher than any time. I think that financial pressures loom all the time, but now we add in the social injustices. And you, you think back to the little six-year-old that shot his school teacher in Newport News just a few months ago. I tell you, beloved, I, I've always believed this, that, that when we remove God and his goodness, Evil comes in. Amen. Evil comes in. Just think about the pressures that some biblical mothers were under. Now, the mother I'm going to be speaking about today, her, her, her name is Nameless. We don't, we don't know her name, so I thought it would be pretty safe in doing that. Billy will probably have some names for you next week. But just think about Eve, the pressure she had. She was blamed for original sin. She had... Her oldest son <coughs> murdered her youngest son, his brother. 
Hagar was Abraham's handmaiden and had a son by him because they rushed God's plan to get ahead of having Abraham having children. They named their son Ishmael. Time came that Abraham sent Hagar and Ishmael away out into the desert because they weren't part of God's original plan. But God didn't turn their back on them. Ishmael is the descendant, his descendants are all the Arabs that we have today. But it's ironic that the Arabs are more multiple than the Jews, and yet they're still fighting each other today. Jochebed was the mother of Moses. The Egyptians were killing all the male uh, Hebrew babies because the population was growing too fast. The Egyptians became frightened. And so Jochebed placed Moses in that little basket and launched him out into the crocodile-infested river. And he became the greatest prophet of all. <coughs> then we think about Mary, the mother of Jesus. No place to even have her baby. She had to go out into a barn, a stable. And then she had to be uprooted and taken to Egypt because of Herod's wrath of killing the two-year-olds. Then you think of losing your child somewhere along the journey, going to church at 12 years old. We knew that Jesus was in the temple, but they didn't know that. You imagine the fear of not being able to find your child? Then think of the trials and the crucifixions that, that she went through watching Jesus there on the cross. The mother in our text today, we don't know how many children she had, but we know she had one daughter, and that daughter was demon-possessed. Not, not an ailment, just demon-possessed. You can imagine the fits and the rages that that little girl was probably experiencing. Mothers have great pressure. And as we remember some of these mothers from the Bible, how would you want to be remembered today? Now, this is not just for the mothers too. Dads, granddads, all of us here. Grandmothers, how would you want to be remembered? Could, how would someone sum up your character, your life? Well, in Matthew 28, we'll look at in a little bit, Jesus said to this Gentile mother, you have great faith. Four words. You have great faith. And those, those words are true because they came from the very mouth of Jesus. And, and this mother, who we don't know her name, has been enshrined through all of these centuries to us. She was a Canaanite woman from the northwestern part of, of Galilee, a country that was very hostile to the Jews. And this is the only single encounter that we have of this mother, this woman. You have great faith. Boy, I'd like to have that on my tombstone. Yeah. But think about this. When we read through the Bible and we sit here thinking together just for a moment, do you ever remember Jesus saying to Peter, James, and John, you have great faith? Oh, ye of little faith, he told them multiple times. But he said to this woman, you have great faith. And this woman is not even a Jewish woman. It's not even from his descendants, not even from his, his background. And what do you think this woman did to deserve the praise of Jesus? And it's the same thing that you and I can do today to deserve the praises of Jesus. Let us commit ourselves through the power of the Holy Spirit to allow Jesus to grow us into having great faith. Faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, I believe without a shadow of a doubt, will solve all of our personal problems and all of our social issues that are taking place today. Let's listen now to what the Bible has to say. Look with me now at Matthew chapter 15, verse, begin at verse 21. Jesus has been teaching the parables <clears throat> about himself and about the kingdom. Beginning of chapter 15, Jesus is teaching about what is clean and unclean. So everybody in, up to this point, the Jewish tradition was what goes in, what you eat is what makes you unclean. So they have all these rules and rituals and regulations about the types of animals they can eat and foods they can't eat. And Jesus it just flipped the, flips the coin totally against that. 
It's not what goes in, because my Father made all of those. It's what comes out of your mouth that shows how clean you are. Because what comes out of your mouth determines what's in your heart. So that attitude is what helps us to be clean. And Jesus is addressing this attitude, beginning here in verse 21. Let's look at this together. Let's do 21 and 22. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from the vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possessions. So this nameless mother, first we see, crossed great barriers. She was a woman who didn't have a place of importance in this Jewish male tradition. She even had less significance because she was not born a Jew. She's a Gentile. Any of us that are not born Jews will be looked upon as Gentiles because we were not born a Jew. So she is a Gentile. Plus, she's a Canaanite, and she's from the territory that's of the, the northwest uh, region of Galilee. If you looked at your Bible map, and if you would just, you'd, see, you'd find the Dead Sea, and if you go right up the Jordan River, you get to the Sea of Galilee. And if you look just over at 11 o'clock toward the Mediterranean Sea, you'd see the city of Tyre. And Sidon is just a little bit up above that. So we're talking about over on the Mediterranean coast of Israel. And I think it's important for us to know why Matthew included this particular uh, parable, this particular teaching of Jesus. I think Matthew is perhaps the Jewish of all of the disciples. Uh, his, his focus of writing his gospel is to prove that Jesus of Nazareth is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He came to fulfill all the Old Testament prophecies. And the style that he's using right here to prove that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords is he's contrasting Jewish thought with Jesus. So here we don't find any compassion from the Jews, but here we find the compassion of Jesus. So when Matthew is calling this nameless mother a Canaanite, he is saying to the Jewish audience and wanting us to know too that, that her ancestors were the enemies of the Jews. The Jewish audience knew immediately the significance of Jesus is helping this Gentile woman. Beloved, I think this is teaching us and wants us to know that regardless of our backgrounds, Jesus' message of faith is for all people. All people. Right here in this sanctuary and up and down the highway and everywhere we go. And all of the bad people and the people that do wicked things, Jesus is still for them. I don't understand why they do that but I know that Jesus is there. Jesus is there. This nameless mother reached out to Jesus. Will you and I reach out? Who, who do you reach out for in your times of need? Do you reach out to your, your parents? Do you reach out to friends and family? Let's don't forget to reach out and reach up to our Father. That's what Jesus is saying here. Here's a mother who... In her need, right there, in verse 23, my daughter is demon-possessed. She overcame her barrier. Faith requires that we be willing to overcome our barriers. Faith requires that, that we're willing to cross over and do whatever we need to do to the glory of Jesus Christ. Listen to what the Bible says. Let's look at verse 23. Verse 23. And Jesus did not say a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. Do you ever know anybody that gets on your nerves? Don't say it out loud. Just, 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 yeah, just think about them. <clears throat> Where I come from, people that just talk, 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 talk. You ever know people that just like to talk, talk? They, they think what they've got to say is the most important thing, and, and it's going to help you whether you think it does or not. 
They're going to tell, we called them the mouth of the South when I was growing up. And the sad thing was that really what they were talking about really didn't apply to, to myself or to other people as well. But they sure wanted me to know what they were thinking. They get on my nerves. The Lord allows them to get on my nerves so I can be closer to him in prayer. Because see, what I would pray was, Lord, I know it's up to you, but if it was up to me, I'd ask for an earthquake right now. You know? <laughs> And just aggravating people. Don't know when to land the plane. You know, you get to talking and you just take, land that plane, you take it back off and keep going again. Some preachers are like that too, aren't they? But don't name any names. Well, let's, 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 let's stay focused here. So the disciples are feeling the same way. They are aggravated. They're agitated by her begging because she doesn't deserve to be helped because she's a woman, but mostly because she's not a Jew. She's not part of us. Now, if she was part of us, we would listen to her, but she's not any part of us. She's different than we are. Well, Jesus, Jesus showed compassion. He didn't respond the way the disciples wanted him to respond. She, he knew her needs, and, and he was there for her. Beloved, do, do we see people as being an inconvenience at times? Instead of being annoyed, let's become aware of the people that God has placed. We think about, well, I'll help my neighbor. You know all our neighbors that live around us. But you know, not, not to show my knowledge, because I have to go research, but in the Greek, you know what the neighbor means? The neighbor's not the person that lives beside you, in front of you, or behind you. The neighbor's the person that's standing beside you. So anybody that is standing beside you is worthy of our compassion and is worthy of faith in Jesus Christ. God says, all people, all people will want what we have. Let us be the people that shares that with them. And this woman takes some actions to show her faith, to, to break through these barriers and so she could get to Jesus. The first action she uh, showed to us was the desperation. She was not going to, to let ill will hold her back. She, she was willing to withstand the social rebukes that were coming at her. What would we go through to get to Jesus? What would we do to get to Jesus? Some people say, well, if, if, if Jesus is love, he wouldn't allow me to have this problem. You know, I mean, that's what you're looking at in Job. Oh, my goodness, that, that's a wonderful book that Pastor Bill is leading us through, the book of Job. God is in control of every event. He's in control of every event. And even though we have tests that come into our lives, God uses them to draw us that much more dependent upon him. This woman's action was an action of love. This, this child, this, this daughter, was demon-possessed. And even though Jesus was standing there in silence on purpose, wasn't, he wasn't aware of her. He knew everything going on around him. Remember the big crowds that were following him? And some woman came up with the issue of blood, just touched the hem of his garment. He, he said immediately, who touched me? Jesus is aware. The silence is a teaching tool that he's using here. And she appeals to Jesus. Even though the disciples are rebuking her, she's coming to Jesus out of love for her daughter. Beloved, there, there are so many social issues taking place now going into our school systems. I pray that very soon that our school systems learn that the Lower scores in reading and writing and arithmetic is not because of COVID. It's because we're teaching moral issues in school where that needs to be taught with mom and dad. And that needs to be taught in the home with the parents, whether that be grandparents or moms and dads or step parents or whatever. So we can focus on the reading and the writing and the arithmetic. 
And my dad always would add in to the tune of a hickory stick. Why do you always put that in there, Dan? <laughs> but this woman also had vision. She saw the compassion of Jesus. And she would not be turned away by the outsiders. She believed in his ability and willingness to, to help. So if you and I are not receiving our prayer request immediately, do we turn away? Do we walk away? Do we give up or do we stay? And know that the vision is it's Jesus Christ. That's why when we pray, we always want to pray, Holy Spirit, open my eyes and my heart that I may be listening to the will of the Holy Spirit through God the Father. A hymn writer wrote a great hymn we're going to sing in a little bit to help us to understand this. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. See, turning is an action that's required on our part. Look full into his wonderful face. Looking requires action. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. This mother received praises from Jesus, and you and I can too. This nameless mother was, was persistent as well. She, she refused to be put off. She was not intimidated. She didn't quit. She continued her course of action. She, she was persistent, and I believe persistence is a hallmark of love. Now, we don't want to badger people because that turns them off. To Jesus and to us. That's where the mouth of the south comes in. But don't give up on them either. Don't give up. Jesus never gave up on her, and he doesn't give up on you and me either. That's what the cross is for. That he died to pay our sin debt that was hindering us from coming to the Father. Now we have great access, direct access to the Father through the Son because of his death on the cross and resurrection over the dead, proved his power and love for all of us. Jesus reigns today in the heart of the believer. And we see this now coming up in verse 24 and 25. Look with me, if you will. Jesus, he answered, I was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came, knelt before him, Lord, Help me, she said. What's taking place in these two verses? Look at 27, I mean, uh, verse 24 there, if you would, verse 24. Jesus says, I, I was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. He's kind of saying, um, so that these Jews, that are all around him listening. Sorry, ma'am. You, know, you don't belong to the right group. You don't have a claim on me. But she let her need speak for itself. Look in 25. She fell at his feet. Look at 25. Lord, lifting Jesus up. Lord, not teacher, not master. Lord, help me. Help me. Only you can help me. That's the essence of a great faith. And this is what it's saying to us that we will always be willing to stretch out before Jesus and pray with confident desperation. Now, whatever it is that we have, we can bring to Jesus. Whatever praise we have, we bring it to Jesus. See, that's, that's one part that's so hard for us to realize, that when we're in pain and agony, that, that, that we're on the top of the circle and everything is great. And then we fall down and, oh, Jesus, where are you? And then Jesus heals us, but we forget to thank him and praise him. And that's what makes it real of his healing power in our brain when we praise him. Praising is for healing to remind us that the next time we happen, and it will happen about every three months, that he got me through this one, he'll carry me through this one. I believe in Jesus, and I come to Jesus. Just think of this geography again where he is located, up on the coastline of the Mediterranean Sea, way, way up north in this Gentile territory. But he wasn't there by accident. He didn't hop on the boat and say, oops, fellas, we wound up at the wrong place. Everywhere Jesus went was with intentionality. He intended to be here for this, this very reason. So how can we explain Jesus' behavior here? 
Jesus was simply telling this Gentile mother that the Jews were thinking that the first opportunity of faith was to be for them. Because, and I still believe it today, that, that God wanted the Jews to present the message of salvation to the world. They were to be his mouthpiece, his spokesperson. Genesis 12, verse 3. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. And all the families on the earth will be blessed through you because you will be telling them of me. Jesus was not rejecting the Jews. He wasn't rejecting the Canaanite woman here, this mother. Jesus had chosen them to be his spokespersons. And I believe today that they're, they're not living up to their original intent. So that's why we have the church age. That's why we're living in the age of the churches now, because the church is given the opportunity for the message of salvation to go forth. So Severin Church, let us turn our eyes upon Jesus and look into his faith, his face, and he will give us the confidence to share our faith with others. Jesus is teaching us that faith is available to all the people, all mothers and moms and dads. Let's look at the last section of Scripture here, verse 26 now. And he replied to the woman, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Can you imagine Jesus using a word like that? Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. You ever wonder why I used the word dogs? Well, the dog was the term that the Jews commonly applied to Gentiles. They, they, they believed that that a dog had more right to God's blessings than a Gentile did. And you think name calling is new today. Look, they're calling each other names way back in the Bible times. But that leads us to ask, how do we look upon other people? Do other people seem to be lower class than us? Or well, what about the homeless or the drug addict or, or the alcoholic? Beloved, Jesus was not disregarding the woman. He's just reflecting the attitude of that moment. And he says, the Jews aren't standing with you, but look, I'm standing right here with you. The woman didn't argue. The woman didn't, didn't want to run away crying. You know, it's ironic. Think about it. The Jews would lose God's blessings and salvation because they rejected Jesus. And yet these dogs, you and me, because we're Gentiles, would find salvation because we recognize and receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of mankind. Who are your eyes turned upon? Beloved, she relied on the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, even the crumbs I would eat if that allowed me to be that close to you. What would you do for Jesus? What would you do? Lord, I don't deserve, it's what she's saying in verse 27. I don't deserve you, but I am praying for your grace to come upon myself and my child and that you will be there for us. And Jesus says, you have great faith. Your daughter's healed from this very moment on. She believed in spite of difficulties. When it gets tough for you and for me, moms, who are you going to look to? I pray that we turn our eyes to Jesus. Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, again, I ask you to teach us. To teach us these words that Jesus said in, in verse 28. Woman, you have great faith. No wonder from that moment on her daughter was healed. She believed 
and her life and the life of her children were changed. Even today, with all that's going on in our world, if we simply believe, our life will be changed and, and others' lives will be changed too. Today, don't despair with problems, with the burdens. Let us too be persistent in our belief in Jesus. Let us commit this day to turn our eyes upon Jesus and to look full in His wonderful face. Here's how to simply do that. If you've never believed in Jesus as your Savior and Lord, you can this morning do this. Say these words to yourself right now as I say them. Admit that I am a sinner, Lord. I have caused you to be sad by the way that I've acted. But I believe at this moment forward, you are the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world and the Savior of my own life. I believe in you. And I want to come today and commit myself to following Jesus. Beloved, may you're here and you've already prayed the sinner's prayer long ago. You've been through confirmations and what all. But you want to come and recommit yourself that maybe we've gotten all focused. We've looked around at what is bad and not where the power of goodness comes from, from the Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to come today and rededicate ourselves to being a disciple of Jesus. We would like to be known as a person with great faith. We can do so this very moment. And if you're looking for a place to join, there are leaders here in the church that would receive you this day as a member. In Jesus' precious name, amen. In these times of uncertainty today, Severin Church would like to remind everyone that you can still tithe on the church website, www.severinchurch.faith, or email your tithes to Severin Church, 9066 Robins Neck Road, Gloucester, Virginia, 23061. Thank you for your generosity.